Hello and welcome, I'm Les Bubka and you're listening to Accidental Podcast or something like that. In this episode, I have a pleasure chatting with Melanie Gibson, author of Kicking and Screaming, Memoirs of Madness and Martial Arts. Melanie is a Taekwondo practitioner, second degree black belt. She lives in Texas. She uh, went through, or going through, I should say, uh, mental health issues. Uh, so we focus mo- mostly on that and her book. Her book is not what I expected to read, <clears throat> but it's a fascinating insight to a human's uh, mentality and uh, issues that can come and overcome us. Um, she's got a great insight in, into martial arts as well so we had a great chat about all, all those mentioned um, and the book I recommend you to read it's not exactly what I expected but if you listen to the podcast you're gonna uh, listen about that it's explained um, fascinating read uh, it really resonated with me especially some chapters so it's a good read uh, it's a nice to chat with Melanie, she's a nice person, and uh, it was a fun, fun interview. So I hope you're gonna enjoy. Uh, before I let you uh, listen to it, uh, if you find this episode give you some value, you enjoyed it, please if you could share on the social media, that's gonna help us a lot to grow. Uh, and as well, if you wanna uh, support what we do, um, please check in on the Creative for Mental Health on www lesbubka.co.uk and you can find their ways of uh, supporting and now please enjoy the interview hello and welcome um today i'm talking to melanie gibson the author of kicking and screaming the memoir of madness and martial arts how are you melanie hi les thanks for having me on your show i'm doing well i'm I'm great fan of that book i had the pleasure to read it um before everybody else read it or most of the people read it and um i really it wasn't really what i expected it um but can you um, give us a bit of a background on your martial arts and, and life? I know that not everybody re- read it yet. So if you give us a, a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I started training martial arts when I was about 10 years old. And I grew up in rural West Texas, as you can probably tell by my accent. I grew up in a small town out between Lubbock and Abilene, for those who are familiar with Texas geography. And I, for some reason, I told my parents, I want to learn karate. And I wasn't really an athletic kid. I was a very good swimmer, but I wasn't good at team sports. I wasn't good in our physical education class in schools. You know, one of the ones picked last for the team, but I was a good swimmer. And and I, for some reason, I wanted to learn karate. And we didn't have a karate school in my town, but there was a Taekwondo school. And Taekwondo is a Korean martial art. It's very similar to karate with kicking and striking and, and takedowns and throws and things like that. So my parents kind of surprised me and said, hey, we signed you up for classes. Let's go watch a class. And we went to watch a class and I was pretty apprehensive. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't think my parents were actually going to make good on what I said. And I loved it. Just I liked the discipline. I liked the structure. I liked the excitement of it. Afterwards, when we got home, my dad and I were kind of dancing around the living room and we were kicking at each other and saying, oh, they did this and they did this. And and we were very excited about it. So I did that and I, I loved it. And we did that until I was about 12. Now, I will say by the time we quit for a couple of different reasons, I was kind of relieved because when I was a kid, I really hated sparring or fighting. Um, I, I just felt like I didn't know what to do. I got anxious and I let that anxiety kind of overwhelm me. So I like it as an adult now. I think it's fun. But as a kid, I hated it so much that mm-hmm. by the time we quit, I was kind of relieved. So put that down for a while. I grew up, became a teenager, went to college, had a life and all this stuff. 
And something that had had been with me my entire life was mental illness. And uh, I, I didn't really seek treatment for it. And I don't recommend that. <laughs> so if, you, if you're having issues, get treatment for it. But in my early 30s, it got to a point where even after seeing a therapist and being on medication, I was still in a really bad place. I was really upset all the time, really depressed, very lonely, just making bad choices for myself. And I thought I need something positive that will get me out of the house that will give me something to focus on. And I thought, well, why not go back to Taekwondo? That was something I enjoyed for the most part. Um, it was something I did before my life became complicated as an adult. So this is where fate comes in, is that my childhood instructors in Snyder reported up to a grandmaster, a old Korean grandmaster in Fort Worth, Texas, um, which is near Dallas. If people are familiar with where Dallas is in Texas, it's one of the big cities. And that's where I live now. And I never knew that he had a school in Fort Worth. I remember him coming to our tests and he would sit there and glare at us and intimidate us. And, and uh, he'd write Korean on our uh, uniforms and sign our boards when we broke them and all this stuff. So he was always this, this interesting force in the background. So when I discovered that the Grandmaster had a school here in the city where I live, my search was over and I thought, okay, this is a fake thing. So I got back into it and I started over as a white belt and then worked my way up to black belt. And uh, once again, I kind of felt that same love that I felt when I was 10. I was just fascinated by it. I loved the focus. I loved the progress that you can make and goals. And what I got out of it was a sense of community that I didn't have before. I was very lonely, kind of antisocial. And I found people I could connect with. And I found something that made me feel good about myself and this is probably the most important thing without needing the validation of other people. Cause that was one of my problems. I, I always thought I had to impress people. I had to make good grades in school. I had to get a good job. I had to find boyfriends who thought I was pretty. And all of that kind of makes you feel empty inside if you don't feel good about yourself. And that's the most important thing that Taekwondo did was helped me find my own sense of self-validation and confidence. Plus, it's really fun. So that's a really long way of telling you how I got into Taekwondo and why I got back into it and, and what it's done for me. So, so here I am, a second degree black belt now, and still loving every second of it. What do you mean you're not pretty? You are a, <laughs> you are a <laughs> Russian bride. So um, I believe that uh, most of the people um, think that Slavic guess are the most beautiful one definitely polish russian and czech and slovakian so you know you're very pretty you don't you have nothing to be ashamed of oh thank you for, for those who think i'm being rude we we've been joking in the messages between melanie and i and and she commented that she felt like a, a russian bride can you explain on that a bit so it's not me being just rude yeah no i think it's funny and and no thank you very much and and i think it's it's uh whether you're pretty or not if, if you have mental health issues or you have low low self-esteem you don't see your outer beauty you don't see your inner beauty so yeah. um i i needed that validation but what what les is joking about for those of you just listening is that in my book i make uh probably not the most politically correct joke but i make a joke that i look like basically a uh, a Soviet or, or, or Russian bride. I don't look like a romantic heroine. I, I, I don't look like a typical American girl. I've got high cheekbones and, and uh, almond shaped eyes and, and I'm, I'm a quarter Lithuanian. So that was a joke I was making is that um, even though my story kind of starts out as a romantic comedy, I'm not a tall, blonde, all American looking girl. I, I look like I come from the old country. I look like my Lithuanian great grandmother. So um, I'm glad I made a Polish person laugh. I'm glad an Eastern European can laugh at my joke. <laughs> so I hope I don't offend anybody. Going back to uh, to that self-validation, I, I totally agree because I, I used to suffer with a lot of anxiety, but for me, it wasn't that just a um, validation. I was uh, actively avoiding a judgment and trying to do everything just to not be judged. So try to, you know, be uh, everybody's favorite in a way that I can kind of have that validation as well and avoid the, the harshness of judgment. Did you afraid of a judgment as well? You think that's a part of a... Uh... Yeah, I think so. Um, for me, I think it's really strong perfectionism, which can be uh, dangerous because sometimes 
uh, chasing perfectionism can result in good things like good grades in school or a successful job or things like that. And, it, it, and it's very seductive because it, may, it convinces you that you're getting all the things that you want. But it's kind of the same of what you were talking about is being so afraid of judgment and being so afraid of doing something wrong that you, you become a false version of yourself or you're always, even if you look like you're smiling to the outside, you're tormenting yourself inside saying, oh, you didn't do that right. You need to do it better. And I think it goes along with maybe just part of my personality, but also some of the, the mental uh, issues that I have, like an eating disorder and anxiety is that just, it, it puts all this, pr- you put all this pressure on yourself. Um, and something that I think we martial artists have to be careful about is too much perfectionism. And I was going to ask you, Les, I read your book, Thoughts on Karate, mm-hmm. and you made a comment that once in a while, karate, or, or there's, a, there's a risk of it being negative for somebody with mental health issues. And I have had my moments in Taekwondo where I either get a little too addicted to Taekwondo as something to make me feel better because I can get addicted to anything. Um, or I would get very frustrated that I wasn't being perfect or I wasn't making progress fast enough. And so if I didn't watch myself, it could become a negative thing, just like everything else in my life. So I'll, I'll turn the question on you and say, in your book, Thoughts on Karate, can you talk about that a little bit more with um, how somebody with mental health issues might have some negative experiences? Uh, for me, it comes due to... Uh mainly the coaching so if you've got the coach who is really um, demanding and not kind of incorporating the the mental uh, mental attributes of the student you can be pushed into like you said not good enough you need to try harder and that's just going to bring people down because you know they're not meeting your expectation and it doesn't don't give give way for them so for me when i teach i really try to incorporate uh, was the student's uh, physical ability and mental ability. So if I see that they struggle with something, I don't. I was actually talking to one of the instructors about it the other day. Um, I don't say, uh, you know, or oh, you're not good enough. You can't do it. You have to try harder. I use a phrase something like that. So they know they are not great at it, but there is a way to improve. Mm-hmm. They don't put pressure on them. Oh no, that's not good enough. You have to do it more, more, more. I say it's something like that, but there is a space for improving. So you're kind of keeping them within their comfort zone because some people are afraid of, like myself, being judged and have a negativity. But there are other people who come with the fear of being praised. So being praised is not something is for me. If somebody says compliment to me, I kind of don't know how to take it. Mm. So it makes me feel uncomfortable and my lead and me to kind of overthinking and you know in a bad way or what did they want something they're praising me for a reason they really want something from me that i i I can lose out on it it's kind of twisted thinking i i Mm -hmm. suppose but you know you just have to fit with the um, people's mental ability and just don't make them feel worse yeah and i think with martial arts is if you're struggling with things like you're afraid of being judged or you're judging yourself and trying to be perfect, that is a good way to learn how to balance that Mm. because you do get a lot of feedback when you're in martial arts training on either something you're doing right or something you're doing wrong. And as, as uncomfortable as it can be sometimes, I think it's, it can be a healthy way to kind of relearn how to take a compliment, how to take constructive criticism, how to, realize that you need to make improvements without thinking, oh, I'm bad, I'm terrible, uh, I'll never succeed at this. But instead of thinking in those extremes, finding the right balance of, of um, making improvements. And, and mm. I think martial arts can give us balance in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think that control failure is the key. But with a supported team of supporting people and non-judgmental, so, you know, we all fail in, in all areas of life. It's just uh, how that um, failure is portrayed to you. And that comes up to our childhood, is it? If your parents and teachers done a good job of um, giving you a failure, but as a lesson, instead of that, you are worthless, then you can overcome that and build up your confidence again and, and go forward. Um, so here's the question for you now. I'm going to be doing that kind of tournament style thingy. Uh, <laughs> in what way... The martial arts, taekwondo in, in particular, 
help you with mental health? I know you write in detail about it in, in a book, but people, we try to encourage people to read your book. So just a quick glance and they can find details in your book. I think it helped in several ways. The, the first way is that it was a distraction. And I needed something like that because at the, I was alone. I didn't really socialize with a lot of people. And when you have mental health issues, it's very easy to get inside your own head mm -hmm. and to live with those problems that you're having and to make those problems seem bigger and bigger. So the first thing was it just gave me a distraction, gave me something to do a couple of times a week. And it gave me something new to learn. So that's another thing with mental health is if you find a new skill, whether it's a language or it's cooking something or building something or a new sport or a new martial art, it exercises your brain in a way that maybe it hasn't before. It's kind of like when we exercise our body, our muscles are sore because we haven't used them before. So learning is a really great way to one, distract the mind again, and then, and two, exercise the mind in a way that's, that's positive and challenges it in a positive way. Um, and then those other things you hear about with martial arts certainly happen, like my confidence grew, my self-esteem grew, um, responsibility. I started taking responsibility for my own feelings and behaviors rather than blaming them on other people. Um, one of the biggest things that came from martial arts is that I became more self-reliant. So I realized that I didn't need praise and approval from other people to feel good about myself, whether it was from my boss or my parents or, or even my martial arts instructors. And it also helped me become independent of the need to be in a relationship, like being, being loved and, and admired by somebody. I didn't need that. Those are certainly nice things, but I didn't need that to feel good about myself anymore um, because I made bad choices about relationships in the past. I, I've ended up with people who weren't very nice to me because I thought, well, that's, that's better than being single or that's the best I can get. And uh, I kind of sold myself short on that. I, I, I ended up in a bad situation because um, I thought that's what I needed to feel good about myself, but Taekwondo really freed me from a lot of those things of needing validation and approval from other people. So how does that relate to mental health is that that's, that's not going to cure diagnosed mental illness, but it can help. It can help you become more observant about your thoughts and feelings and behaviors, which if you're working on your mental health illnesses, along with the professionals who are treating you, um, you, it doesn't happen passively. You have to take an active part in it. So I think that helped me too, is be very observant about my thoughts and feelings and patterns. And just like how we change our martial arts technique over time, I learned how to observe and make improvements on my mental health technique too. And I think that's where it really helped with overcoming some of the, the hardest parts of uh, depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. Mm. So yeah, I think that's what uh, I'm mostly now answering because, you know, I've got that uh, karate for mental health page and some people sending me uh, messages saying, you know, oh, karate is a good therapy. Uh, and I have to explain that, you know, karate itself, it's not a therapy. It, it works well with the therapy when you've got something, like you said, distraction, something to do, but you need to seek the professional treatment because none of the, if, if it's not the medical person who is trained in the mental health, we, we cannot do uh, really anything except give that support of the group, non-judgmental environment and physical exercises. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And um, it, it doesn't take the place of mental health treatment. Uh, that's why we have professionals. That's why we have therapists and, and doctors. And um, I'm seeing after the pandemic that more resources are popping up for mental health, which is it's not it's a bad thing. We went through that, but it's a good thing that more attention is being paid. But yeah, I know people joke and kind of say, oh, Taekwondo is my therapy. Karate is my mm -hmm. therapy. Well, that's good. But if you have a serious mental health problem, you need to seek the professionals. Um, mine mine kind of came from a mix of both because I, I don't want to say that what my treatment wasn't working for me. I think I wasn't working for me. Yeah. Um, I, I was taking the resources and the medication and everything that was available to me, but I still needed to do some kind of work. Um, and that's just for me. I'm not saying that people, you know, who aren't improving, aren't, aren't doing the work or whatever. I'm not criticizing anybody else, but I think for me, it was a, a combination of the treatment I got from the professionals, but then, you know, the professionals that are treating you only see you 
a couple of hours a week or a couple of hours a month or every couple of months. So during all that time, you, you have to do something, um, whether it's just taking your medication and doing what your therapist told you to do, or it's finding something additional to that. Maybe it's doing karate or it's, it's writing or, or doing something that just helps you get through the day to day. And I think so, that's something that martial arts can do for our mental health is it gets us through the day to day of life when it can be difficult sometimes. Mm. Reading your book and, and you mentioned relationships, um, especially the relationship you described with Ricardo. Mm. Um, do you think that he actually had a mental health as well? Because reading through your stuff, it, it seems to me that he himself had the mental health problem, but not diagnosed or never paid attention to it. Well, that's a good question. And you're pretty astute on picking something up. So uh, I first want to say that I am not a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I'm not going to diagnose anybody. Mm. Um, he did admit some depression to me. So um, without, you know, revealing too much about his personal life, he did reveal that. And when I look back at some of the behavior, I could see things that may be classified as narcissism, mm -hmm. um, very controlling behavior. Um, I don't know if he's been diagnosed with that. I don't want to diagnose him with that. But if you look at that relationship, there was a lot of gaslighting going on, uh, gaslighting towards me and uh, a lot of mixed messages and a lot of controlling behavior. And that's something that we see with narcissists. So, um, and, and he had his own kind of eating issues and, and body image issues too. So again, I don't think he was ever diagnosed with, with an eating disorder or anything, but I think those behaviors were there. Um, depression was definitely there. So I think that, that led to some of the, our relationship was pretty volatile. And I think that led to some of it too, is that he had some mental health issues, some diagnosed, some not. And I had some mental health issues, some diagnosed, and then um, the eating disorder was diagnosed later, so some not. So that was a pretty uh, explosive mix of people who were kind of, kind of had their mental health together, but not all of it. And so we ended up clashing a lot because we just couldn't handle our own issues. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I kind of, uh, that was a surprise for me because I started reading about relationships and I thought, wow, it's another girly book. Um, you can like, go into relationships and stuff like that. But then I thought about it and I thought, shit, I'm, I was in a relationship like that. So my mm -hmm. ex-girlfriend before I met my wife was uh, regularly every half year we went through the process. No, I'm, it's finished. We're done. I'm going to move out. I don't want to see anymore. And then back again to normal life. And then again, and, and suddenly once is just like you. I said, oh, okay, just let's finish it. And I moved on. I moved out uh, and, and, and I was done. And, and she was surprised. She completely didn't expect to hear that because she was so used to it that I'm always going to say, oh, okay, let's try again. Let's be mm -hmm. better. I'm going to give away on this. You know, you can take my stuff of them. I'm not saying she was bad. It was good, but the day without argument, it was a day lost in, in that relationship. Mm. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, uh, I feel so you I, on that. <laughs> well, I, I eventually decided that now that's enough. I had enough. I lost interest. I want to move on. I want to have a peace and quiet in my life. Um, She kind of took it like, hang on, that's not in a script. We meant to go back again. And I find a kind of feeling that it is same with it was the same with you that you went to that stage that it was enough was enough yeah and it's it's uh, i'm glad you found you could connect with it because yeah my my book is about a, a female character it's about me it's about a uh, a relationship, but we all go through different types of relationships, whether it's with a boss or a friend or a parent, we can all experience toxic, abusive relationships. And I think for him, he enjoyed the game of breaking up and making up and, and getting back together. And he would often hold the threat over my head of, you know, well, if we don't agree on this, we should just go our separate ways. And it was a game. And then I, you know, I'd cry and say, oh no, please, I don't want to break up. And, and then finally I was kind of like you, I said, it, he, he said it again and I said, okay. 
Mm. You want to break up? Fine. So it's kind of a surprise, isn't it? Just like, oh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and what, what I don't share in the book is that, cause I, I put a, you know, a, kind of a neat bow on that is that uh, it, it was a little messier after that than I share in the book is that he, he kept trying to, to come back and, and I had to, and it was, it was harder than you'd think it was to stand my ground mm. and say, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Because when you get in these toxic abusive patterns, you just keep going back to it. So um, it could also be, I felt like that with some of my own mental illness is that um, especially with the eating disorder, it makes me do things that make me feel bad and I don't like it. And so I think, okay, I'm done. I'm breaking up with these bad mental behaviors, but then you go right back to them. Just like an abusive partner, they've got some, they've got some sense of control over you. Or if you're addicted to something, you're kind of addicted to this relationship, even though you know it's bad for you, it's it's harder to stand on your own two feet without it until you build up that confidence and belief in yourself that you can survive without the mental patterns that you have or your addiction or your relationship. And it probably, you probably had that moment too, where you thought, I can get by better by myself than I can with you. And that's finally what had to happen with me. And I think people will get a little frustrated with me in the book is that I stay for so long in this relationship, you know, um, but I wanted to show what one of those relationships can look like is that it's sure. It sounds easy to say to somebody from the outside, well, why don't you just leave? But it's harder than you think. And I, and I wonder with you, with your, with your ex-girlfriend, were people telling you, hey, you need to get out of this relationship. You need to just leave. Uh, no, no. It, it may be portray her, her in, a, in a bad light. She, she never been mean to me. And, and oh, okay. Like that. That's good. It was just uh, our chemistry was very explosive, but not in a, in a bad way. We just had the different opinions on things and yeah. find a way. So it, there was no nastiness between. It's oh, just that's good. Know, her way was oh, okay. We need to split up, um, and eventually I just thought, yeah, okay, it doesn't work. We tried so many times. We just not. We are better friends than uh, we've been coupled. So we are still in touch. So there's no yeah. No bad oh, blood. that's that's good. I'm glad that wasn't a, a bad relationship. But yeah, sometimes pe when people want to solve the problem, they say, well, let's just break up, and they don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. they think let's spend some time at or i don't I, they don't know how to say i don't agree with you but let's talk yeah. it out um, but I, I can see what you're saying because when i was reading the book it's like god damn it it's obvious melanie just say bye bye I know. and that's it <laughs> it's so obvious but it is obvious when you're looking from the outside of the bubble that you are in and you know i've got a friend who wants to change his job for years but he afraid so much of moving on because he don't know what's going to happen and he always comes up with excuses, you know, oh, it's going to be this, I've got this, I have to do this. And I know that it, it is a, it, it's easier to have a known evil than unknown good of that mm -hmm. fear of going out there and getting, because you just don't know what's going to happen. You might end up worse. So you kind of cling to that, what you know, instead of going and search. It took me a long, long time to actually enjoy going out there and doing new stuff. Uh, is yeah. that the case for you now? Are you yeah, I think so. Um, um, the phrase we have in America is the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think I'm becoming less afraid of the unknown. And it's very easy to cling to what you know. Um, but the unknown can have some exciting things too. And I think going back to martial arts is that it, sometimes it's scary going to a new level or learning a new skill. I was really nervous the first time I went to a red belt class. Mm -hmm. I'd never been a red belt before. I didn't get to that level when I was a kid, but it was time to leave the lower levels behind. So I think now I'm, I'm still pretty, pretty structured and rigid and I like things the way they are. Sometimes I don't like change, but I think I am more open-minded to things being different and not being so afraid that it's always going to work out in the negative. I think that's something we have to get over is, is a fear of the future. And you're always thinking it's going to be the worst situation. And usually it's not. Usually it's, maybe it's something that's not what exactly what you wanted, but it's usually not as bad as you think it's going to be. And sorry, my headphones falling out. You have to be open to new possibilities. And that's something I had to learn and, and Taekwondo and, and even going through that relationship was a very good lesson in trusting myself 
and trusting myself to handle whatever situation comes my way. Hmm. I, I, that's why I believe in, in, in karate, well, all martial arts and, and sporting aspect, because through that exposure to new things, you can learn, you know, we all, um, I don't know how much tournaments you've done or seminars, but you are, when I go into the uh, competition or seminars, I always imagine the, the worst things, the more, most worried thing is that I'm going to fall over before the mats and uh, everybody's going to be laughing at me. I don't mind the beatings, it's just don't laugh at me. Um, <laughs> and uh, our mind is that, that projection is really good with projecting that bad things to happen. But like, like you said, it's nearly, nearly never happens. And I think that exposure in martial arts gives us that being accustomed to it. And look at you now, you published book. I can see that every day you're doing some kind of podcast, talking to new strangers. And, you know, there's no, no sign of you being overwhelmed by it. So I think you, you managing it very well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting year. Um, I'm, I'm still working. I have a full-time job. Um, I'm recovering from knee surgery. And like you said, I'm doing all these podcasts and this book publicity and it's, it's been, it has been a little overwhelming and I've had my little moments of just breaking down and wanting to quit and thinking, I can't, this is too much for me to handle. But then I think, hey, wait a minute. I, this is what martial arts helps with too, is you can go back and remember, Hey, I, I fought in that tournament or I passed my black belt test or I did all these things. So it's a good way to prove to yourself that, that I can handle what life throws at me and I can take on new things and I can be a leader and I can be responsible and, and um, deal with challenges that come to me. So that's another thing going back to your question about how does martial arts help with mental health is that it, it helps you keep perspective that, yeah, things can be challenging, but it's never as bad as you think they are. And you'll get through it. You know, the, the fighting match will be over. The test will be over. The, that class that was just, just very frustrating will be over. And everything passes and everything moves on. I think that uh, from my, my point of view, the, the most challenging things that I worry about the most, it always turns out the most rewarding it's like, you know, mm -hmm. you're going on that mat with somebody who you know, uh, you know, it's going to be a difficult, but then you won or you lost or you done it. And it's just like, yeah, that was, that was great. I want to do it again. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You feel good afterwards and think, well, what was I so worried about in the first place? I used to get nervous before my belt tests and, um, but once I got through it, it felt great. And I will say the only time I never felt nervous was during sparring matches, which mm -hmm. was the thing I used to hate when I was a kid. But as an adult, um, it, I, I, it's not the thing I'm best at, but it's the part where I learn the most. And I feel like I'm applying what I learn the most. And it's, it's, it's a good, that's probably one of the best distractions ever, because if somebody's trying to kick you in the face, you really can't think about anything else. If you do, you get hit in the face. Yeah. You get, <laughs> so it's, it's probably the best way to be present and focused and undistracted ever and and i do get nervous before i go into those sparring matches but then i'm so in the moment and i'm so focused and it's so much fun is that once i get through it i think oh wow i want to do that again that was fun what let's move on to the next thing that's fun mm -hmm. and which i like the structure of your book because you're not only going about your relationship but you as well um put in the chapters of your gradings and you go in the details to the gradings which grade was the other best one? Which one you uh, the most fond memory? I think the one that meant the most to me, maybe even more than black belt was testing for red belt. Because when I was a kid out in West Texas, I had gotten to uh, blue with a, a red stripe, which in kind of old school Taekwondo grading is the grade before red belt. And I'd can never you, done that. Say, can you say in numbers because the color of the belts are different so you've, I have got to a, think, you've got a 10 grades, isn't it? So from 10 I think to so. One. So yeah, it's, it's changed a little bit. So the way I learned it in, in old school, traditional Taekwondo is you have white belt, uh, yellow, and then you add a green stripe, mm -hmm. and then you have green belt, you have green with a blue stripe, blue belt. I hope you're counting because I'm not yeah. blue with a red stripe, red, and then you get two black stripes and then black belt. Is that 10? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's 10. About, okay. Uh, you've been about six, seven. Ah, sorry, for, uh, for free. Okay, and then nowadays they've added an orange belt, which wasn't around when I was a kid. I think they just kind of, they divide up some of the white belt training, so I don't really count that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, so I'd never gotten to Red Belt as a child. And so that was to- totally new uncharted territory. And I felt like when I was testing that this was kind of going back to keeping a promise, maybe that I'd kept to my inner child of, of doing something that makes me happy. Um, I'd been out of Taekwondo for over 20 years. So um, this was, I think I was proving to myself that I was committed to doing Taekwondo, that I was committed to improving my mental health. Um, and, and this was a whole new world for me. So that's even, yeah, even more than my black belt tests, I think testing for red belt is my most special memory of Taekwondo because it, it meant so much, not just in Taekwondo, you're, you're getting into those higher belt levels, but for me personally, in the entire journey I'd gone on, this was a marker that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making a commitment to myself and I'm making a big positive change in my life. For me, it was the, the green belt. So it's the, the middle, midway fifth queue. That was the my, my I think the hardest mentally test. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's kind of similar for everybody. Kind of halfway, you've got that breakthrough, and uh, and, and you start noticing that you are uh, competent in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, so we uh, both went through the spell of bad uh, mental health or lower mental health. We both done martial arts, and for me. It crept on me. I never noticed the improvement in my uh, confidence, awareness, and stuff like that. How was with you? Did you have the moment where you noticed that, yes, I am better now? Or is it just really, for me, realizing how it went, it was writing the book. It kind of structured for me the progress of how I went. How was it for you? How was the process of noticing that positive change? I think I noticed it more as it was happening. Um, And that's how I started writing about Taekwondo. I started a blog called Little Black Belt, like Little Black Dress, but it's Mm -hmm. Little Black Belt. Um, And I started that in 2014. And I was, I don't know, a blue belt or something at the time. I was a color belt. And I was having a lot of insights about, um, about my mental health, about life, about the life lessons you can get from anything that happens on the mat. It could be something an instructor said. It could be something you notice about yourself as you're training just about either lacking confidence or having confidence or setting goals, all those things we learn about. And I just had to get it out of my head. I I come from a family of creative people. So um, my, my dad paints, my brother's a musician, my mom knits and cooks and sews and all these things. And we do all these things to express ourselves. And I used to draw and I don't anymore. And now I express myself through writing and I just had to get it out. So I started writing this blog and I think it was a combination of just living through it and then writing about it. And the more I wrote about it, the more I started to realize, oh, wow, this is making a change in me. I'd been writing in journals for about two years prior to that. My, my therapist had begged me to do it. And I finally took her up on it and started journaling. And, and that's an excellent way to uh, help with your mental health is just to observe your thoughts, to write down, even if you're writing down all the things you're worried about, somehow getting it onto paper or onto a computer screen is a great way to get it out of your mind and to process it. And I think that's what I was doing as I was writing about Taekwondo. And then I found, Hey, I've got a story here that I could turn into a book. And I think in in two different ways is one, it's a unique story is that you don't hear about a lot of women in their thirties and forties getting back into a martial art, much less getting a black belt. So that's, that's a unique thing that may people may find interesting, but then in another way, it's a very common story because I think the stories we hear about most often with mental health are the extremes. We hear about the suicide attempts or we hear about the hospitalizations and those are very real things. And those are real things that need attention and and care. And then there are a whole bunch of people who are suffering from mental health issues in silence. Um, I don't know what the statistics are in the UK, but in the United States, one in five people, one in five adults in the United States has some kind of mental health condition. Mm. So it's very common. And we're not, we're not all running around screaming in the streets or doing whatever the stereotype says. We're just living our lives. We have families and jobs and school and, 
and life. And that's the story I wanted to tell. And the people I wanted to reach are the ones who are like me, who may have been suffering in silence for a long time or feeling like they had to hide who they were and what they were struggling with for fear of, of judgment or, or, or some kind of um, discrimination or something like that. So that's why I started writing the book as well, was to tell that unique story of martial arts, but then the very common story of just a normal looking person dealing with mental health issues. Yeah, the statistics are pretty much the same in, in UK. Uh, and, and it's shocking, you know, it, it's shocking that uh, in a way that people have to feel like they have to hide because of the mental illness. You know, if you break your leg, you're not hiding somewhere. Oh, I, I'm not going to go to doctor because people will not be pointing at me that I've broken my leg. You just, it automatically, I'm going to the doctor to be fixed. But when you, somebody has got the mental breakdown, it's like, you know, hush, hush, and you have to hide and, you know, you don't want to be judged. And, and I hope that my work and your work will um, help to change that, you know. Um, I see the more, more movement now towards the mental health and sports is growing. Maybe because of lockdown in UK, after lockdown, there is a huge spike in, in mental health uh, interventions. Uh, and it's really now most of the association organization putting some effort into the at least awareness of you know how to deal with, uh, with your students who might come and, and, and have a mental illness. And help, and I think we need to do more um, to promote uh, mental health in, in in all. And you're doing a great job of it. Yeah, thank you. And something about writing the book has been it's it's forced me to be very open about my mental health issues and become an advocate for it. Because it's one thing to write a book in private, and it's another thing to have it published and to publicize it and talk about it. So um, it's it shown me kind of how hypocritical I've been is, is hiding it and, and not wanting to, to say anything because of my own bias and stigma toward it. But now it's shown me that it's okay to talk about. And um, I, I'm seeing the same thing in the United States is seeing more of a response to mental health. I work in the healthcare industry. So um, I'm not a frontline worker, but um, you know, we, we, we support the people who are working on the front lines caring for, for COVID patients and everybody else. And my organization has started to pay more attention to mental health. And between that and writing the book, I've, I've mustered up the courage to have a conversation with my boss and say, look, I'm suffering from mental health issues right now. I'm, I'm stressed out. I need some support. I need some help. And, and you mentioned breaking your leg as an example. Um, I tore my ACL last year and had knee surgery. And it's funny how open I could be about knee surgery. I mean, everybody I know, I'm, I'm, I, if I don't know you, I'm going to tell you I had knee surgery. <laughs> everybody knows about it. And my coworkers, everybody knows about it. And everybody was so supportive. And I felt I, I had no issue saying, hey, I can't do you know, this certain activity or this certain thing because of my knee or because I need to take time to rehab my knee and care for it. Meanwhile, I've been suffering from anxiety and depression and, and these things that have been triggered by just everything we've gone through with the pandemic. And I've been too afraid to speak up and say, hey, I can't do these certain things because of my, my anxiety. And going through a really big physical issue and seeing the treatment I got versus not really sure if I get the same kind of accommodation or sympathy for mental health has shown me that there's, there's still a big divide between um, treating our, our caring for our physical body and treating it when it has issues versus how we care for our mental health. Um, because mental health is important to everybody, whether you have a diagnosed condition or not, we all have minds, just like we all have bodies, you know, whether you have healthy knees or not, you need to take care of your body. And it's the same for your mind. And, and my boss was pretty amazing about it. She's very compassionate. She just listened. You know, she didn't try to solve all the problems. She didn't try to fix everything. She just listened. And, and we've been able since then to have a more open dialogue about it. Um, but I, I only felt comfortable doing that after I saw my company start to make some strides toward supporting mental health and, and supporting diversity. Um, so, so we're getting better. In, in the United States as a whole and in, and in companies, but I think we still have a long way to go as far as normalizing talking about mental health. I think the, the part of the problem, I kind of can see 
uh, because before I got involved, I realized that um, I myself had an issue. Um, you are kind of fed by the media, by TV and uh, um, uh, film industry, that if somebody's got the mental health, he's going to probably try to kill you. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? So pe people are afraid of that. Oh, you've got the mental health. So first comes to mind, oh, he's a serial killer, or he's got a mental health issue, he's going to be violent and stuff. And that's not the case in most of the people. Rarely they are violent people. Usually they're hiding, like you or myself, and, and you know, trying to be stay away from people and have a peace and quiet at home and kind of over process what's going in our head, which make it worse. Instead of going out there, talking with people and see that maybe, you know, with an anxiety, I didn't realize that so many people had the same issue as I have. Only when I started working with the mental health charities, I realized that shit, there's, you know, hundreds of people just like me going through very similar stuff or even worse. And, it, and that helps. And I'm going to finish that thought on the question. Um, for me, sending that book out with being completely honest about my vulnerability made me feel relieved. Is that the case for you? Yes, that was the exact word that came into my head as you were saying it. It is relief. At first, I was scary because I thought, okay, once I say this, I can't unsay it. Yeah. You can't unring that bell, um, but and, and I can't hide behind the mask anymore. But yeah, when I sent it out there to the world and I realized that, oh, I'm not going to lose my job over this. I'm not going to have everything taken away from me. And even if that happened, it's, it helps to be a little more vulnerable, a little more honest. It was a relief because I could finally stop hiding. I could finally stop torturing myself with perfectionism and this pressure I put on myself to look perfect because, you know, it's kind of like being in that bad relationship. You're afraid of the alternative. I was afraid of the alternative of which would be people knowing that I have mental health conditions. And as I've started to kind of test the waters and talk about it on a podcast, talk about it with my boss, which was a huge thing and put a book out there for people to read. I realized I've only gotten support. Everything has been positive. Um, if, if I experience some negative feedback, you know, that's just, the, that just happens when you write a book. Um, but it's not as, it's as scary as I thought it would be. And I think it takes people like us to speak out and say, hey, I've got a mental illness or I have mental health issues. And I'm a, I'm a regular person. I want the same things we all want. I, I want to be happy and I want to be healthy and I want other people to be happy and healthy too, is that we start to make it normal and say, hey, this is just a normal thing that happens to a lot of people. And we don't want, we don't need fear and isolation. We need support. So yeah, it's, it's been a big relief to just be more open about who I am because when you're hiding behind a mask and you're trying to be somebody you're not, that's exhausting. Yes, it is very exhausting. Um, yeah, for, for me, uh, after that relief um, came in, how to say it, a total satisfaction, having people sending me, you know, I published it a year and a half, nearly two years ago, uh, constantly getting messages from new people, how the book resonates with them, help them to turn their lives around. Uh, the, the one of the most... I, I really cried when I got the message. I had a, a guy uh, messaging me that he literally, before reading the book, was thinking about suicide and <sighs> really contemplating him. And now he said, now I'm, I'm off to the dojo. I'm going to be trying. Thank you very much for writing that book. That's what I needed. And he found him on the right time. So I, I'm, I'm very happy that I published the book. I had at least one person to, to change their life, hopefully, around. And it's you, you cannot get that in any currency. That's what Matt Jardine says, that's invisible currency, you know? Mm -hmm. that one one thing, one person saved is all I need to have as a fulfillment. Yeah, that's an amazing story. That's I would cry too if I got a message like that. And I've, I've gotten, I haven't gotten I feedback quite like that, but I know I, I had somebody message me and say, um, they wanted to buy it for their, their child because their child was going yeah. through some mental health issues. I've had people say, you know, I'm not that interested in martial arts or Taekwondo, but your book still really resonated with me. And that's, that's the fun thing about memoir is that it's usually about mm -hmm. something very specific. Um, you know, I'm reading a memoir right now about a, a woman whose husband 
died of brain cancer. I have not been through that experience. I have not been through her other experiences, but I can still get something from her story. So yeah, my book does have a lot of specifics about martial arts, but you don't have to even like martial arts to get the story. And one of the most uh, most thoughtful things I got was a letter from a physical therapist who's treating me for my knee right now. I'd, I'd given her the book as a gift and she doesn't really know much about martial arts other than what I tell her, but she said, the, the mental health part of it, the relationship part of it really resonated with her. Um, she liked the vulnerability and the bravery of sharing my story. And I've heard that from other people too, is um, that they don't, you know, Taekwondo doesn't really mean anything to them, but the, the mental health part did. And I've heard from other people who are martial artists who don't do Taekwondo and who, who weren't sure they were going to be interested, but you know, the relationship part stuck out to them or the mental health part did, or, or, you know, even if it wasn't their specific martial art, they got the same feeling of, yeah, this is, this is what makes me feel good when I train in, in my martial art. So I think we, we have a common human story to tell. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about memoir, because it can be through any vehicle. It can be about mountain climbing, or it can be about baking, or it can be about playing a musical instrument, but the, the human story underneath it is what resonates and what makes you want to go back and read that book mm. again and again. I mean, one of my favorite memoirs is by a cardiologist, mm. not something I want to do, not something I really understand, but it's a beautiful story. Um, another one is about climbing Mount Everest, not something I want to do, but it's a beautiful human story. Mm. And so that's, that's what I hope to do is connect that human story to people like me and people like you. So, um, in the process of writing a book, how many times you change the book? How many times? Oh you my gosh! Oh. <laughs> so that's, so that's, I, what, that's what people don't know. You know, people buy the book and thinking, "Oh, that was an easy read," you know. But in writing it, even in an easy, easy read, it takes a lot, lot of work. Yeah, writing is a lot of work, and then editing is a lot of work. And I originally wrote, I could say the first draft was around 2015. Mm -hmm. So I'm six years older than that now. Life has changed a lot. My writing style has changed a lot. And I think I've gotten better. And so um, Stephen King gives the best advice of just get your, get your crummy first draft out. It's not going to be good. Just get the thoughts out and then you edit ruthlessly. And so I, I couldn't tell you how many times that book has been edited, um, probably 20 at least all the way up right until, <laughs> right until printing for publication. I was making tweaks here and there, which probably didn't make my project manager very happy, but, um, yeah, it's, it's writing and editing a book is a, is a harder process than it says, but it's a rewarding process too, because you become a better writer through mm -hmm. writing. You become a better writer through reading because you, you study the craft and you, you figure out what you like and what you don't like and what you can learn from it. So yeah, I, I would say at least probably 15 to 20 drafts of my book. So, so what about you on your latest book? How many drafts do you think you had? Oh, I just, uh, I just uh, read it and I'm uh, very unhappy with it. So I'm going with a pencil and it's going to be back and <laughs> change it. That's the, that's the first, I just finished it. So that's the first one. But yeah, it, it, for me, it's more difficult because I write in Pinglish, so Polish and English mixed. And then my wife reads it and corrects the English. And then it usually turns up to be a completely different book than I wanted. So I have to re-read it, re -read it again and again. So it's kind of a teamwork. But without her, I would be lost. And other people who kindly helped me along the way and uh, improve my English as well, you know. Because yeah. I'm, still, I'm still using sometimes Polish grammar. So we put the, the, the words are kind of, the sentences are reversed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just write it in English that way. And people look at it and it's like, what did he mean? So having my wife, who is a martial artist as well, it makes life easier. She's English, so, so she can correct English and she knows what I mean in terms of martial arts, uh, which makes it easier. You've got right. the perfect writing partner. And I admire yeah. you for writing in, in another language. Um, I, I learned Spanish in college and I could write and read some of it, but I, cert I couldn't write a book in Spanish. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I yeah, it's I admire funny. you for doing that. It's funny because I couldn't write it in Polish. <laughs> it's much easier to write it in English. You know, I'm living 15 years now in, in UK. and I barely use Polish. So this, this is thought which I stole from my wife. And that we usually have a one and a half language. So 
if I speak English all the time and I go to Poland, I'm stuck, start, starting to speak to my mom in English and she just looks at me bluntly and says, what do you mean? I, I you know, speak in our language. So it takes me some time to kind of get back. Mm-hmm. And then when I back to UK, I put Polish words in it. So it's kind of, uh, uh, that's how my brain works. So it's a bit complicated, <laughs> but it's fun. That's fascinating though. I didn't know your wife was a martial artist. I knew because I read your books that she helped you edit, but that's even better that she understands martial arts. So she, she can, she knows what you're saying. She knows the message that you're, you're conveying or, or the, the technique that you're talking about without you having to explain it to her like you would to somebody who doesn't know anything mm-hmm. about martial arts. So that's, you sound like the perfect writing team. Yeah. Uh, th- although she's a bit, uh, uh, not upset, but disappointed you know that's bringing me to my uh, question to you have you changed your opinion on having children because uh, she we've got two children and she literally can't do any training she's just thinking now to, after well four years four and a half years going back to to karate because it just you know life was so demanding that it's part of my job so I go and train so I've got that uh, escape but then she have to stay with children although even I encourage her her body says no or her mental state says you know after being with children being work at work it's just exhausting and then you know body can take only as much as it can isn't it Mm -hmm. you ask a hard question nobody's asked me that question before but um that that issue but it's fair for you to ask it because that's a big issue in the book you've read the book so you know um that was a big point of contention in my relationship but but no i i do not want to have children i have have not held children so i consider myself child free and and it, it's for a lot of reasons. Um, the main one is I just don't want to. I think um, some, not everybody is meant to be a parent just because we can doesn't mean we should. There are a lot of people who who are parents who probably shouldn't be and and maybe some people who aren't who, who would make good parents. But I think it's, it's a very individual choice. Um, I haven't gotten the pressure that a lot of American women have to to have children. Um, my parents have been very respectful about it. They, you know, they, they see me as an autonomous adult. And, and, um, so it, it's hard work. I admire people who have children. Um, my, my brother and his wife had a daughter last year. So my, my niece, so I'm an aunt now, and, um, she was born prematurely. So, so she's had some challenges and babies are, are hard work. And it takes, it takes a lot. And, and I, re- and I respect that too much. I think to, to do that to myself or do that to a child who may not get enough of what they deserve. So I have a lot of respect for parenthood. Um, I'm not the right kind of person for it mentally, physically, um, you know, it, it, it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right for me. So yeah, the, the shorter answer is, is no, I just don't want to. And and I'm satisfied with that choice. Um, I think we can find ways, uh, you know, whether we like kids or not, we can find other ways to, to, to be an influence to children. Um, I love my niece very much. And so I'm looking forward to finding ways to, to teach her about life. She's got a whole book she can read about me. <laughs> and um, I, I still don't want kids, but I think I became more tolerant about kids as a martial arts instructor is that they're fun. They're fun to teach. Uh, they're funny. Um, you can learn a lot from them. Um, and then I give them back to their parents. And that's always the best part is I can send them home and go home to a quiet house. But I I, I softened up towards kids a little bit as I was teaching Taekwondo. Yeah, it's always fun to kick them in sparring, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> this one little kid, he's one of my favorite little kids. One of my my one of my friends and I still talk about him. Is I I sidekicked this poor little kid in the throat, and he was probably six. <laughs> and he just kind of coughed, and I thought, oh no, I hope his mom didn't see me. I said, are you okay? Are you okay? And he just nods, like, tough little soldier. And he just gets right back into it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun to spar with okay what's what's the future project for you what future project for me i think so um you know i i, I thought this would be one and done but but you get the bug for writing and you want to do more so um i could probably get another memoir out of everything that has happened between 2015 and 2021 you know i i left my old taekwondo school i had a major knee injury and surgery lots of things have happened in life um i've gone through some other mental health things so i'm sure i could write another memoir about that um i'm curious about 
fiction. And I know we both we both are, have a mutual friend with with mm-hmm. Matt Jardine online, and I think he's getting into fiction too. He did his memoirs, yeah. and now he's getting into fiction. And I've thought about that too. I don't have as much experience writing fiction, but um, the two genres that really stand out to me are comedy and horror. <laughs> which seem very opposite, but those are my favorite types of movies to watch and my favorite types of stories to read. And I think it's because it makes you feel so much. Comedy can make you laugh so hard and, and you have such a good time and horror in the same way, in a different way, is that it really gets inside your head. It um, affects your emotions. It affects your thoughts and it makes you think about things that you may not want to think about. So I would I would like to explore those two things with fiction, but um, I definitely have another memoir in me. So so more to come on that. Excellent. Um, can you give us uh, where we can buy the book, where people can buy the book, when they can follow you, when they can connect with you? Sure. So a couple of things on where you can buy the book. It's available wherever books are sold. So however you prefer to buy books, of course, it's on the big ones like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and it's available in a nice paperback form or a, a e-form as well, if you prefer uh, electronic books and um, bookshop.org, IndieBound, all kinds of, of booksellers. So really just look it up online, however you want to buy books. It's pretty easy to find. Um, I'm pretty easy to find too. So you can go to my website, littleblackbelt.com. It's a a blog mostly, but I've been also posting the articles that I've been writing about mental health and about my book. Um, All my podcast links are there. So if you go to the page, Melanie in the media, uh, I'll also put a link to our podcast when that's posted. And also I am on social media as Melanie Gibson author. So I'm most active on Instagram and also Facebook and Twitter. So Melanie Gibson author is where you can find me. I'm going to put the links in the description. So everybody can click in and I um, highly recommend to grab the book. Even if you're not a martial artist, it's uh, memoirs are a great insight to people's life. And that's my favorite type of a book. So I highly recommend to to try it, connect with Melanie and uh, keep pushing her to write another book. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on your show. 